Saints, good evening. I pray you are doing very, very well as you have walked today with the risen Savior, with the living Savior. He loves you so much. You know, as we were worshiping, it dawned on me that I don't know what your routines are, what your practices are, um, the day-to-day, -day, the routine, you know, the day in and day out. Everybody has a routine. You get up, you do what you do, you get your cup of coffee, you run out the door, you go to work, uh, you take a lunch, you have your favorite places you go maybe for lunch, or you sit at your office and you eat lunch at your office. Um, and then, of course, it's time to go home, and then you make the commute back home, and you have dinner. Whatever your routine is, can I give you a suggestion? Worship the Lord. As you're getting ready in the morning, have worship music playing. Worship puts a melody in your heart, and so on your way to work, put worship on in your radio cassette deck. <laughs> Our cars uh, still have the cassette decks in them. They're old cars. Mine has a CD. <laughs> high tech. Some folks are high tech. They got a CD in their car. You know, put a compilation of music together. Get it in the car on your commute into work. Or get it in your, if you take the train or however you commute to work. Get some music, get some get some worship music, good worship music that worships Jesus, not worships yourself. You got to be careful with worship today too because a lot of it is just self-worship. But good worship music that honors the Lord, it puts your heart and your mind on the Lord. And then your lunch hour, read the Bible on your lunch hour, listen to worship music, go on a walk in the evening. It's such a blessing to worship the Lord. To have a melody, a song in your heart, it dispels all kinds of stuff. Music is amazing what music can do, and the world is using it for all kinds of evil and, perver and perversion. Mm -hmm. Oh, but goodness, I can't tell you the day sometimes I will play a song that ministers to my spirit and glorifies the Lord. I'll put it on repeat and over and over and over and over and over again. It's like a cleansing that happens as I declare Jesus is king. Jesus is faithful. Jesus is able, you know, and then and then it just it lifts me up. And um, it's a good way to live. If you don't have that in your routine, can I suggest put praise in your routine? Mm. Worship the Lord in your routine, and you will see that a lot of things change as a result of you worshiping the Lord day in and day out. You're getting ready for bed, okay? Worship music playing in the background, or even, look, it's, it's bedtime. There is nothing that says you cannot be praising the Lord in your heart day in and day out from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. There are times that the Lord has planted a... Just a chorus in my heart, and then I'm singing it like all the day long uh, over our Resurrection Sunday. You know, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, nobody has ever known, you know, and so... Man, I was singing that chorus from the time I got up to the time I went to bed. It's just refreshing. Just a suggestion. Let's look at the Word of God. John chapter 4. This is an account, special account, where our Lord meets with one woman. In John chapter 4, this is the account of the Lord meeting with the woman at the well. It's a one of the famous stories of the Bible. Let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we look at this story afresh. John chapter 4, please turn in your Bibles there. Begin reading in verse 3. It says that Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He needed to go through Samaria. That's important. 
He came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was tired, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, that is, twelve noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews, here you have it, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Mm. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So first things first. In verse 3, we read that Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. From Judea to Galilee is a direct route through Samaria. So if you're going to take the, the shortest path, the most direct path, you go through Samaria. But as we've just read, the Jews and the Samaritans, they have no dealings with each other. Between the Jews and the Samaritans, there's racial tension and there is religious tension. And let me tell you today, in the church, there is still racial tension. Of course there is. Otherwise, why would there be black church and white church and Latin church and Asian church? And, you know, there's tension. It hasn't changed. There's religious tension. You know that the Lord didn't come to earth to set up denominations? Mm-hmm. You know, today there's Baptist and Pentecostal and Methodist and Lutheran and all kinds of denominations. Religious tension, racial tension in the church today. That doesn't honor the Lord. That's very, very sad when when you see that happening. You know that our brothers and sisters, are you listening? Our brothers and sisters are all over the world. And not everybody worships the same. We've been to Haiti. You know that our, our Haitian brothers and sisters, they don't worship like we do. They're very lively. They're very responsive in their worship. You don't look at the sea and there's one type of fish. No, there's all kinds of fish. So there's all kinds of tension in the church. All kinds of tension in the church. And that's unfortunate. That's a woodpecker. Under the house? It's on the house. Ooh, can you go check? The woodpecker, y'all, trying to destroy the house. So. Now it's on the roof. Notice with me in verse 3. It says, he left Judea. We'll have to edit that. Notice in verse 3, it says, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. The Jews never took this direct route. The tension between the Jews and the Samaritans was so tough that they they never took this direct route. They actually either went through the way of the Great Sea, so they, they went way out of their way to go around Samaria this way, or they went through the mountainous area of Perea, a treacherous journey. But they didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans. There was this tension that existed between them. And then notice with me, Jesus is tired, and Jesus is thirsty. Jesus was 100% man, and as a man, he got tired. As a man, he got thirsty. As a man, he wept when Lazarus died. He's touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He was tired. He was thirsty. 100% man, and he's 100% God. But as a man, he's tired, and he's thirsty, Something interesting happens here in our verses that we've read. It's the noon hour. Now, let me tell you, drawing water from a well was either done early in the morning, and the women, it was their women's responsibility of the day to get water. And women went together 
to draw water from the well in the early morning hours because it was cool. And they went together or they went in the evening for the same reason. And they always traveled in groups. Safety in numbers. And either in the morning when it was cool or in the evening when it was cooling down. But this woman shows up at this well at noon. That is noteworthy. And she shows up by herself. That is noteworthy. We're going to find out that this woman had five husbands and now the man that she's living with is not her own. This woman's life is a mess. And Jesus needed to go through Samaria to meet with one woman whose life was a mess. Let me take it a bit further. This is a type of woman that would not be welcomed in most churches today. This is exactly the type of woman that Jesus wanted to save. And it says that he needed to. I believe in the King James it says, he must needs go. Jesus had an appointment with this woman, a divine appointment. Aren't you glad that Jesus had a divine appointment with you? You know, the Lord came to save sinners. The physician comes to treat the sick. The church should be a place like a hospital. In fact, the Bible instructs us to be hospitable. That's the word hospital. should be a place where the sinner can find forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. Instead of shunning people, the church should open their arms and receive people and give them the good news of Jesus Christ, that their sin can be forgiven. Jesus needed to see this woman. And she comes by herself and she comes at noon. That she's not welcomed in the company of these other women. But our Lord is there. She's, she receives the, the, the shock of a lifetime, right? Because she didn't know that she had an appointment with Jesus. Mm -hmm. She didn't know that she would be talking to the Son of God on this day. But the Lord always keeps his appointment with people. His meeting with people. He's there and he says, give me a drink. And then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? And again, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This is a common thing. I mean, everybody knew that. She's shocked. She's shocked, number one, that there's someone at the well. She goes expecting to see no, no one. She's shocked to see a man at the well because men didn't go to the well. And she's shocked that this man is Jewish. So she's taken completely off guard. And he says, give me a drink. Now, here's something. I've heard uh, Bible studies and, you know, well, well-intentioned um, people teaching the Bible. And we love formulas, don't we? And so I've heard the Bible study, I'm sure you probably have as well, is where like they put John chapter 4 in a formula. We're like incurably attracted to formulas. Just tell me what to do. Steps one, two, three, four. Tell me how to evangelize. And this is a text that's taken to. This is what you do. First of all, you find common ground. So like Jesus here, it was water and he was thirsty and she's coming to draw water. Just find common ground. So if you're at the grocery store, step one, find common ground. Have you seen the peaches? Oh, they're very good. Have you seen the bananas or the, the prices here? Did you know about the sale? Find common ground. And then you work your way into, you know, weaving the gospel message in there. Listen, let me tell you something. I am not about formulas at all. Mm. At all. I don't have a step one and step two and step three. The Bible says walk in the Spirit. The Bible says have fellowship with the Spirit. And as you, as you encounter throughout the day co-workers and people on a walk or people at the gym or at the grocery store, whatever the case may be, most of the people that you will encounter are lost. In fact, it says here before our uh, text that we're reading, it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So there's two types of people. There is those that have eternal life that have believed in the Son and those who have the wrath of God abiding on them. That's what Jesus said. That's what the Word of God says. And so listen to me close. 
knowing that, having that knowledge that the wrath of God is abiding on those unbelievers, it moves my heart to pray and say, Lord, whoever I encounter today, lead me by your spirit in the conversation. How do I start? What do I say? I'm not relying on a formula. I'm not saying, okay, well, let's just seek the common ground and let's go here. No, sometimes you don't, you don't have time for that. It's an elevator ride. You know, it's a quick bus ride. It's a quick encounter in the neighborhood. And so you trust the Lord. And in that moment, you say, Lord, the wrath of God may be abiding on this person. They may not know you. They may not have eternal life. Lord, anoint me by your spirit to speak the word to them that's going to get them in their hearts and get them thinking or even get them saved. Mm -hmm. You give me the words to say. So saints, let me encourage you. <laughs> Throw away the formulas. Walk some people are studying all their life formulas. Oh, I'm going to do this and do that. Forget all that. Just walk by the Spirit. Trust the Lord. Walk by the Spirit. Get into His Word and let the Lord guide you. In the day-to-day -day life, let the Spirit of God guide you. You could see a formula in here, but God doesn't do this for every single person. The Lord walked by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Walked in the power of the Spirit. Jesus asked for a drink, and the woman goes and she says, wait a minute, this is not right. Don't you know? We should have religious tension and we should have racial tension. Je Listen, Jesus is not religious and he's not racist. That's not news to anybody, right? So Jesus doesn't abide by the rules. We see that over and over again as a theme in our Lord's life as he didn't abide by the rules of man. And so this woman's taken off guard. And then Jesus says, well, if you knew who it was that is talking to you, the gift of God, you would have asked of him living water. Now, let me help you here. In Jesus's day, in the days of the Old Testament as well, living water, living water meant fresh water. Living water meant drinkable water. Living water meant life-sustaining water. There's ways to get water. You can go to the river, and that's living water. It's living because it's running. It's living because it has life in it. It's living because it's drinkable. And then there's water that you get at wells. And that water could be good water, or it could be bad water. Let me explain, using something from the Old Testament. God told Jeremiah this. He said, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken the fountain of living waters and have hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So there is living water, which is fresh and sustains life. And then there is water that is stagnant, that is filled with bacteria that will get you sick and possibly even kill you. And so there is there is water that's in a well that has become stagnant, that has become um, bacteria ridden, parasites live in there. And that's because there's a crack in there and now the water is not drinkable. And so when this woman heard living water in her mind, she immediately thinks of life-sustaining fresh water drinkable water, incredible water, right? This other water is stagnant and it's poison. It's just not good water. Well water that has been polluted. Let me give you something to think about. There are today many, many people that are in the days, like in the days of Jeremiah, they have forsaken the fountains of living water and they've hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Bad water, poisoned water. What do I mean? Well, there's a lot of people that are drinking from polluted wells. Doctrine that they're believing. As an under-shepherd, it is my responsibility to say, Oh, don't drink that water. That's polluted water. Don't forsake the fountains of living water. Don't go to that polluted well. Don't go to that well where you're going to get sick. And so this woman, she's drinking from the well of sexual immorality. 
It's a broken cistern. Her life is broken. And Jesus is saying, your life, what you're drinking out of, is getting you sick, your sin sick. There's no life there. That's where the world is. That's where some Christians are. They're drinking from polluted wells that are very hazardous to your spiritual health. And Jesus is saying, I am the fountains of living water. It's awaking her curiosity as to who this strange man is that she has encountered at a well and his words are penetrating her heart because listen every single person in Jesus's day knew that living water is good water that's the kind of water you want mm. you don't want polluted water and so let's continue in verse 11 it says the woman said to him sir you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep where do you get that living water are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. And that you spoke truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I want you to see the, the succession here where she's calling him sir. And now she says, I perceive that you are a prophet. She's drawing closer to the Lord. And Jesus, of course, is not talking about just the regular water that's in the well. He's talking about the water of spiritual life that is in Christ, this living water, refreshing water, a water that is abundant, he says um, in another verse in scriptures in the, in, the, in the gospel, he says, Come unto me, all ye that weary and are heavy laden. Come unto me, all ye that are thirsty. And out of your innermost being will, will flow cur uh, torrents of living water. Mm -hmm. He's talking about a changed life. He's, he's given this woman an opportunity as he's talking to her to abandon her life of sexual immorality, of trying to find fulfillment in a man, and, and one failed relationship after the other, after the other. Now she's living in sin and in fornication. The Lord is not condemning her. The Lord is not bringing, you know, harsh judgment on her or saying, you you know, you nasty woman and nothing of that. He literally, there's conviction there. The way she's living is empty and Jesus is drawing her to this living water to Christ himself, who is the living water. She says, I have no husband. Jesus says, yeah, you have well said I have no husband. You have had five. Mm. And now the man you're with is not your husband. You're living in fornication. And then the woman says, our fathers, verse 20, worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Again, religious talk. You know, religious talk is what's, what, what are the rules of worship? Where should we worship? What should be the posture of worship? What song should we do in worship? How should you dress in worship? You know, even now, I'm wearing a hat. Some people get really offended. Oh, how can you be wearing a hat? It's all, it's all religious. The way you dress, the way you sing, the way you... You know, and so now this woman is trying to make a religious argument. Like, just tell me where to worship. Just tell me the right church to go to, the right message and the right. And Jesus is not going to entertain that. Because worship is, as Jesus is going to say, in fact, he says it right here. Look at verse 21. He says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, there are people, again, that are um, confused religiously, right? They're believing, like, you remember, again, the resurrection message. 
um, conf confused what they're believing about Jesus, mm. the doctrines of Jesus. Religious confusion, doctrinally and, and spiritually confused. And that's the Samaritans. You see, the Samaritans had a hodgepodge of religion. They had the God of Israel, but they have they they had intermingled with the God of Israel. They had intermingled pagan practices, and so what they had was a hodgepodge of religion. A lot of people today, that's what they have. They have a hodgepodge of religion. They take a little bit from here. They take a little bit of this false doctrine. They take a little bit of the Bible here. They take a little bit of this book over here. And they come up with their little hodgepodge of religion. And Jesus is not into religion. And he clearly says to her here, you don't even know what you worship. <laughs> then he says in verse 23, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Notice what Jesus says. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Those two are married together. What is truth? Truth is doctrine. Doctrine is a non-negotiable. Listen, how you worship the Lord, your style of worshiping the Lord, the times in which you gather, the creeds, the things in the church, the liturgy in the church, those things are all a lot of latitude there. Okay, but what there is, where, where, where there is no latitude is truth, mm -hmm. doctrine, what we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that he died on the cross as a punishment to forgive us of our sins. We believe that he rose again from the dead. We believe that he ascended into heaven. So there, there are doctrines of our faith that are non-negotiable. Jesus wasn't one of the many sons of God. That's not true. Jesus wasn't a, a just another good prophet. That's not true. There's some religions today. That's what they believe. These, these are non-negotiables of the Christian faith. In other areas, the style of worship and all these other things, those are, in, in this area, we I have latitude. I can worship with my brothers and sisters in different denominations, in different countries, with different styles of worship, but we are united in the truth. Mm. Now, in some circles, again, the truth doctrine becomes legalism. The truth flows over into how you should dress, how you should look, you know, all, all kinds of things that it becomes legalism and they abandon the spirit they abandoned the, what is what is the essence of the spirit of god is love mm -hmm. the spirit is love so they have the letter of the law they don't have the spirit of the law and whenever you have that dichotomy in a church you have phariseeism and legalism mm -hmm. you have to jesus said the law or or the or the truth or the doctrine of the lord the commandments of the lord must be honored in the spirit of the Lord, in spirit and in truth. When you have those two together, you have the love of God being expressed through the word of God. And now you have the harmony of truth and you have the spirit of God. In other churches, it's the other way around. It's everything's the spirit and they abandon truth. And so here, and so here you also have disorder. Right, because now it's just oh, the spirit of God is moving, and and we're and we're speaking in tongues, and we're swinging from the ceiling, and we're falling out. But the word of God is never taught. Doctrine is never taught. There's an abandonment of truth, and it's just one big emotional exercise. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? And so God, Jesus, He marries these things together. You worship in truth. There's order in the church, but there's latitude in the church. There's doctrine must be upheld in the church. It's the, the church is the pillar of truth. We need to sustain doctrine. We need to adhere to doctrine. We need to be close to doctrine. But we have to do so in the spirit, which is love. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be careful because, and you know, we don't just make up rules in the church and say, well, this is what we're going to do. No, it has to be according to the word of God. And it has to be in the spirit of God, which is love. 
Those, those are the type, look at again, verse 23. True worshipers, these are the type of worshipers that the Lord is seeking. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. It's critical, Pastor, if you're listening, Elder, if you're listening. Don't abandon truth for the sake of the Spirit. And then have just emotionalism in the church. And don't abandon the Spirit to adhere to just hardcore truth with no love. Balance. Saints, listen. Balance. The truth of God coupled with the Spirit of God. And now you have balance in the church. You have balance. Now, verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Notice, we don't get to choose how we worship God, how, how we approach God. No, Jesus says, those that worship God must. There's no latitude here. There's no if, ands, or buts here. Must worship him in spirit and and in truth, married together. That's so critical in your personal life and the church life that we're worshiping the Lord the way he told us, not the way that we want, not the way that we can think. The church, It's not my church. So we're going to worship the Lord the way he instructed us to worship him. And he says this, you must worship. God must be worshiped in spirit and in truth. Listen, in the Old Testament, you came to God the way he said. Right? Through sacrifice. Through the Levitical priesthood. Not anybody can just enter into the Holy of Holies. Now we have access to the Holy of Holies in the New Testament. We're a, ro a, a, a royal priest, a priesthood, a holy nation. Now we have access to the throne of grace. We come the way he says, and he says... Those that come to me, those that are seeking me, those that worship me, must worship in spirit and in truth. Saints, that is critical today mm -hmm. in the days in which we're living. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. <laughs> Is there anybody more gentle and more loving than Jesus? He must needs go through Samaria. That tells us that Jesus is going to keep all of his appointments with sinners. All his meetings. He's never going to be late. He's never going to be early. He's going to be right on time. He knows when and where to find this woman. Mm -hmm. This woman's life is a wreck, is a nightmare. Personally, impurity. She's living a life where she's drinking from a well that is putrefied. It's destroying her. She's religiously confused. In her heart, there is, there is this stigma where there's racism. Jews and Samaritans, we don't deal with you. You know, it, it's just a hot mess. I thank the Lord because when he found me, I was a hot mess. I had a hodgepodge of religion. I grew up Catholic and being a Puerto Rican Catholic, uh, I don't know if you know, but Puerto Ricans are a third black, a third Indian, and a third white. So if you ever visit Puerto Rico, you're going to see black people there, brown people there, white people there, people that look very much Indian there indigenous to the Taino Indian that lived there when the white people came over with black slaves. And so Puerto Rican Catholicism, which I grew up in, a hodgepodge of religion. A little bit from Catholicism, a little bit from our uh, African roots, a little bit from our Indian roots. You have a, a, I had a, I was a mess. I was a religious mess when the Lord kept his appointment, his meeting with me. How tender he was. I was believing. That's why I have such a passion for doctrine 
and I have such a passion for for saints today who are drinking from polluted wells. And I say, don't drink that. Get away from that water. It's going to destroy you. I was believing so many lies, religious lies. I was going to hell believing lies that were generational lies. My grandparents, my great-grandparents um, had believed this. You know, parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. And so I thought, man, of course they can't be lying to me. No, but they, but they were believing a lie and they just... This woman was believing all kinds of lies religiously. She had things in her heart that weren't right. And you know what? The Lord just doesn't leave her there. He says, listen, you don't even know what you're worshiping. And he does it so gently. And I remember he did it so gently with me. And one thing after another, he went removing and taking away these lies. As I read more of the word of God, as I understood more, you know, some people, they get so twisted. If you tell them, hey, that's not in the word of God. The way you're, the way you're doing this or doing that, that's not, that's not truth. You need to abandon that. Abandon that well that you're drinking. Well, who are you to tell me what to do? This is how we worship and this is how we, you know, where we worship. And my great grandpappy was a pastor. And uh, uh, hey, okay, yo, whoa. I'm just saying that's not in the Bible. What you're believing is not in the Bible. That's not, that's not the Lord. What a mess. Do you remember what a mess you were when the Lord saved you? Maybe you were in a religious mess. Maybe your mind was a mess. Your life was a mess. But he came to you like he did to this woman. And little by little, he drew you with cords of love. And then there is this desire for living water. And then your life is changed. The gospel changed my life. When I understood it by the unction of the Holy Spirit, he opened my eyes. My life was completely changed. So this story has personal significance to me. And maybe it does to you as well. May today, listen, may today... You find yourself the rest of this evening, tomorrow. May you find yourself worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. Believing his word and walking in the spirit of love. May the Lord bless you. And uh, Lord willing, we will see you on Saturday. Let me pray with you. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this privilege. Lord, thank you for saving us. I know that perhaps my brothers and sisters, they too were like me, believing a whole bunch of lies in a religious hodgepodge of a mess. (laughs) You rescued us, Lord. You met us. You kept your appointment with us. And you gently, Lord, by your love and by your truth, you drew us into salvation. And Lord, you changed our lives. Lord, any saint today, any, any, any believer who is drinking from a polluted well, Lord, may you draw them back to the fountains of living water where they can drink freely, Lord, and abundantly. And, my, and may out of their innermost being flow rivers, torrents of living water to refresh those around them, to encourage them, Lord, and to bring those that are abiding under the wrath of God into true light and salvation by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. See you soon. Lord willing.